I'm Dr. Deborah Kimless, and I am the Chief Medical Advisor for Pharmacan, who is a platinum sponsor of this conference. I want to thank Heather and Lisa and everyone else in part of the organizing committee for inviting me here today to talk to you about my two most favorite subjects. One is medical cannabis and the other is research. This is my disclosure slide. I was told I have to always do this, but it was really interesting. I have evolved within this industry from direct patient care to being a consultant in the uh, cannabis pharmaceutical development companies to being a chief science officer for an investment company to actually developing protocols, getting them IRB approved, and running clinical trials for companies in the cannabis space that either want to distinguish themselves from other people, other companies, or people who actually want to take their formulations to the FDA. I started out as an anesthesiologist, pain management specialist, and lifestyle medicine, so triple board certified. I herald from New Jersey. Sadly, I am a Giants fan, which is the most painful thing you could be next to being a Cowboys fan. Ooh, um, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's not easy. But anyway, we moved to Florida during COVID. And so now not only, only am I a Yankee, I'm a damn Yankee. That's the person that moves permanently to the South because they realize how beautiful it is and especially the Southern hospitalities. Next slide. So who here knows who this is? Okay, so this is Nancy Reagan, former President Reagan's wife. So my understanding of medical cannabis or cannabis as a medicine didn't herald from anything I learned. And in fact, it was a pretty new concept for me. I grew up during the time of Nancy Reagan and then former President Ronald or then President Ronald Reagan during their Just Say No campaign. And she was proselytizing the evils of all illicit medications, but especially cannabis. Next slide. And I knew always at a very young age that I wanted to be a doctor. And I believed our politicians and their spouses because why would they ever lie to us, right? Why would an elected official ever lie? And as a kid, I believed exactly what they said. And I'm like, I need my brains. These are my brains on drugs. This is not where I want to be. Next slide. So when I started in 2013, looking into cannabis as a medicine and trying to understand that, I started doing my own research, which back then was very challenging. And I started seeing lists. And these lists are conditions by state for which people can be approved for using medical cannabis for a medical condition. And if you see here, this is a list for Texas that they currently have. Next slide. And when I look at other states, this is their list. A quote. Next slide. And I'm like, wait, how could this be? How could all of these seemingly disparate medical conditions be treated with just one plant? Is this medical cannabis or is this medical cannabis? And as a doctor, I took my Hippocratic Oath very seriously. And I did not want to have parentheses around anything I did regarding patient care. And so I literally did a deep dive into understanding what cannabis is. Next. So who here knew about the endocannabinoid system? Okay, who here knew about the endocannabinoid system before this weekend's um, conference? Okay. This is amazing because in 2013 and 14, I would ask this question and I would hear crickets. And I'm talking about lectures that I give to my medical colleagues. So. Applause to all of you who raised their hand. And if you don't know about the endocannabinoid system, don't feel badly because sadly, it's not being taught in any traditional educational platform. So the endocannabinoid system, when I learned about this in 2013, was my aha moment. Oh my God, we have a real bioactive, biologic system 
that interacts, next slide please, with every single biologic system in our bodies from, our, from thinking to pooping to everywhere in between. In fact, life as we know it would not exist without an intact endocannabinoid system. And yet it is not taught in any biology class. It is not given in any medical school, any CME class that I've paid thousands of dollars to maintain my medical certifications for. It is not taught anywhere, although I do teach it at a couple of medical schools around the country, but quite frankly, it's, it's insane. So wait a minute, if this is such an important thing that it governs all other bio, biologic activity, right? From thinking to pooping and reproduction, and everything else, why is it that it took so long to figure this stuff out? I thought about this for a while and I decided this is why. Different than an organ-based system, biologic system where I can cut you open and look at the heart and blood vessels and your lungs and your kidneys, right? You can visually see this. And different from a cellular-based system, like you look at red blood cells and white blood cells and different kinds of things within the blood, this endocannabinoid system is a chemically based system. And even more difficult is that these chemicals are made on demand. They're used locally. They are not stored in our body. It's the only neurotransmitter that's not stored and it's rapidly broken down. So it took a lot of really, really, really smart scientists and people to research this thing, to sort of decide what these building blocks are regarding this endocannabinoid system. Next slide. And again, my aha moment was, holy smokes, we've got this biologic system I didn't know anything about, and I'm a doctor, and how could I not know this? And then when I learned that the chemicals in the cannabis plant, actually the chemicals in the trichomes, the outer pockets of the cannabis plant, interact with our biologic system, with our endocannabinoid system, that's where I understand where the power of the cannabis plant resides. That this plant directly in, interacts with this biological system that we have that governs and maintains physiologic balance within our, bio, in our, within our bodies. And that's always like, mind blow. Next slide. Okay. So it was for me, 2013, I'm a little slow learner. What took so long? This is a lecture for another day. However, I would like to recommend this book called Smoke Signals. It's old, but it's good. And it's written by a, a very smart journalist, a guy named Martin Lee. And he sort of characterizes the systemic vilification of cannabis by a lot of really wealthy people. And they sustained an incredible marketing campaign that was really used to sort of subjugate um, people at risk, as well as supporting petroleum-based products. How's that? Next slide. So before I get into my talk about clinical research, let's talk about this. Well, we're in, we're in Texas A&M, and I learned yesterday that the A stood for agriculture. And so what better a place to do research than Texas A&M, right, on, on a cannabis plant. So my talk today is not about research regarding the actual cannabinoids in a uh, basic science research, but holy smokes, what an amazing opportunity in this incredible university. My talk is about clinical research. And when I use the term clinical, it means in people. So it's either drug development within people, or it means um, things like medical devices, like a pacemaker in people. So that's where we're going to, because when people say, where's the research? I'll show you soon. There's a lot of research out there on the cannabis plant. It's just because of its nature within the federal political landscape and law, we don't have a lot of in vivo or in people research, but maybe we do. Next slide. 
So when it comes to clinical research, if you were going to go to the FDA, there's actually four phases to ensure and enhance safety. Because really, at the end of the day, we want to have people effectively treated. We also want them safe. You don't want to be killed by the effectiveness of a, of a chemical or of a molecule or of a drug. So the first one is primary, primarily for safety. It's used in really small populations. I like to call it the friends and family. You know, it wasn't so long ago, in fact, probably maybe I did it, um, that people would try things out on themselves and go, wait, this actually works, right? That's the phase one. It's certainly codified. The FDA approved it. They look at the basic science research to make sure that nobody's going to die from it in animal models. But it, again, it's in a very small population of people. Phase two, we expand the numbers but our inclusion and exclusion criteria for who can participate is very narrow because again, we wanna make sure that it's safe and of course effective, but safety number, no, number one. Phase three goes into expanding the population of who can try this medicine. And then phase four, the FDA says, congratulations, you've got a drug, but we're gonna monitor complaints if there are any to see whether or not we gotta pull it or we gotta put a black box around it or whatever. Next slide. Okay, so why should we care about cannabis and cannabinoid research? So if anyone's thinking, this is boring lecture, and I want to kill myself right now for waking up so early, I want to get a cup of coffee or go to the bathroom, I want to be so bold as to say, this lecture actually applies to everybody in this room and probably everyone. So let's see who should care about research. And I'm talking about clinical research. Say you're an investor. Say you've got some money. Say you just pulled out all your money from that Russian oil investment that you made maybe a couple of weeks ago and thought that was bad. And now you've got some extra cash and you say, a friend comes up to you and goes, oh my God, best in class. This is incredible. Either formulation or method of administration or whatever. You should be asking, where's the clinical research? Say you're a legislator or a regulator in a state that is just beginning or continues to have a medical cannabis um, program and somebody wants to come up with a new indication. Now, fun fact, I believe that a legislator and a regulator should have nothing to do with writing these long lists, that this should be determined by a doctor-patient relationship, but because this industry is, is nascent and people are just learning about it, there's a lot more controls. We'll get into that in a sec. But anyway, say you're a legislator who wants to have an indication for pain, chronic pain or severe pain, they should be asking, where's the clinical research? So, suppose you're a physician or a healthcare provider and you've been reading about this. You saw Dr. Sanjay Gupta's, you know, weeds one, two, three, and four. And you want to say, I want to help. I want to be a part of this, this incredible opportunity for, to use this new medical tool for people. You should be saying, I don't know what to do. Where's the clinical research? Say you're a cannabis company and you're growing and you're processing and you want to distinguish yourself from any other cannabis company. So you decide you're going to run clinical trials on your own iterations. And another clinical, another cannabis company goes, oh yeah, well, we got the same stuff they do. This cannabis company can say, where's your clinical research? Say you're a company with a big idea. You want to make sure that you have the most robust big idea and it's substantiated because your investors are going to say, where's the clinical research? Say you're a patient, a caregiver, a veteran, an advocate. You're going to say, I want to help people or I want to be personally helped. I don't want to be harmed. I don't want to have a bad experience, whatever that may mean you're probably saying, where's the clinical research? So it's important. But just so you know, and this may not be known to you, that not all decision is made on clinical research. That sometimes emotion gets into it. Go figure. Some people actually base decisions on emotion. And sometimes people with a lot of influence. So this, believe it or not, was a marketing campaign ad that cannabis, they call it marijuana with an H, can cause misery, weird orgies. I don't know what a non-weird orgy could be. I'd like to understand that definition of what a weird orgy is and wild parties. Next slide, please. So our first USA-based clinical research actually started in 1939 in New York. 
the then governor Fiorello LaGuardia, who the airport's named from, actually hated prohibition of all kinds. In fact, there's a picture of him drinking during prohibition. But anyway, he just, there was something called the Marijuana Tax Act. Who ever heard of that? Okay, good. This, you guys are amazing. So for those that don't, don't feel badly about it. So they actually said that they were going to put a tax on marijuana. And what that meant was they were making a stamp. And this is what these stamps look like, were supposed to look like. If you were going to make marijuana or sell it or buy it or whatever, you had to have a, a stamp to show that you paid this tax. Interestingly, they never made the stamp. So it was a non-starter. So Fiorello LaGuardia actually hated that the government did this and decided to commission a report through the New York Academy of Medicine. And five years, they looked at whether or not cannabis was something that should be vilified or something that should be freed. Next. So after five years, they did a observational prospective, it's a cohort study, which is a pretty robust thing. And we'll go over the hierarchy of, of cannabis, um, of, of all clinical trials, and you'll see what I mean by this. And they found that despite popular belief, it didn't cause violence. Cannabis didn't cause insanity. Cannabis didn't cause sex crimes or lead to addiction and wasn't a gateway drug, which was, which was very interesting. And so the publicity over this catastrophic effect of, of cannabis was unfounded. Interesting, they used the term marijuana. People at that time didn't even know what that word meant. They knew cannabis. And up until 1942, you could go to a pharmacy and buy a cannabis tincture. My grandfather was a pharmacist at that time. He probably made those tinctures and made those decoctions for the treatment of different ailments. And doctors and pharmacists who supported cannabis didn't know that this campaign of anti-marijuana meant anti-cannabis. Isn't that interesting how the manipulation thing? Harry Anslinger, whoever heard of Harry Anslinger? Okay, so Harry Anslinger was the czar. The, he was in charge of prohibition. When prohibition went away, he had to get a new job. So he recreated himself to make himself the drug czar believe it or not, and this is right before the DEA. And he was saying, this LaGuardia report after five years of an observational study was garbage, not true. And he said that this reefer madness was actually true. And I wanna turn your attention to this circle. It says, there's a teapot here. They'll put this in your tea. And Harry Anslern said that the LaGuardia report was not based in science, yet his was not either. And this picture proves it, and I'll tell you why. If you take tea, which is 170 degrees Fahrenheit, hot water, and you put in cannabis leaves, you'll get THCA out of it maybe, and CBDA, which is the acid form, will not cause any intoxicating effects. I'm not suggesting that THCA is an incredible bioactive compound. It molecule it is. And so it's the, all of the acid forms. But Harry here is telling you that you can be slipped into your tea or your coffee, and that doesn't cause any problems. It may help you sleep better. Next. Okay, so let's fast forward to 1970s. None of you were around then except for me and Dan. And so 1970s, the president, Nixon, who absolutely was a proponent on the war on drugs. He wanted to take people of color and certain religious groups and throw and protesters of the Vietnam War and throw them all in jail, quite honestly. And so he wanted a strong statement against cannabis. He called it marijuana. It should be, it should be, um, be mandated a, a 10 year sentence in jail. And so he commissioned something called the Schaefer Report. Schaefer was, a, was an attorney who did a two year uh, study, another cohort study, looking at whether cannabis was evil or not. Upshot, Schaefer decided after all of this that cannabis actually should be decriminalized. And all the buzz, pun intended, about cannabis was really deflecting a, from a bigger problem, which was uh, an opiate epidemic, even back in the 70s. So this, our opiate epidemic, sadly, is not new. Next. So what happened? Nixon 
punished Schaefer for this, refused to make him a federal justice. He established the, the 1973, he established the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency. He signed off on, um, on um, the Controlled Substances Act and placed cannabis into a schedule one category. So if you're a real life physician and you can write prescriptions, you can apply for a DEA license and that allows you to write for prescriptions that are DE schedule two to five. So from opiates to composine and everywhere in between. Cannabis was a schedule one, which means that it has no medical or therapeutic potential, highly addictive and a high potential for abuse. I don't know, guys, that sounds like tobacco to me, but yet we can buy this on any street corner. So what's the current status of cannabis and cannabinoid research? Where are we today? So interesting where we are today is that more than 50% of this country, because it's a federalist country, has some sort of a medical cannabis program, over 50%, 37 states and the District of Columbia. Isn't that incredible? And yet it's still federally illegal. So I digress. If you go on to PubMed and put in their little search bar cannabis, you get 27,800 hits of research peer reviewed articles. Is that incredible? Cannabinoids. So the cannabinoid is like, what are the chemical molecules within the plant? 31,000 plus peer reviewed articles. Next. So this is in contrast to, and I wanted to sort of balance this out to like, what does those numbers really mean? So metoprolol is a beta blocker and it's given to people who've had heart attacks or have an irregular heartbeat or some who have social anxiety that can't get up in front of a, a, a crowd and talk would take this. When you put that into PubMed, 8,600 as compared to 31,000. If you look up aspirin, something that we buy over the counter all the time, 4,500 articles. Ibuprofen. 16,500. Ivermectin and COVID, I just did that sort of as a fun fact, 388 articles. So no one really can say that there's not research. I think they're just not wanting to look. Next. So this is in contrast to, but this is, yes, sir. Yeah. All, all over. All over, yeah, good question. Um, so this is in contrast to in 2000, if you put in that same like cannabis and cannabinoids, I'm, I'm sorry, in 1980s, there would only be about 2000 articles on cannabis and cannabinoids. And between 1990 and 1999, there's 3000, but there has been a call to action. And in 2020, in spite of COVID, there was a record number of scientific papers submitted and approved for cannabis, over 35, hundred peer reviewed publications on the medical importance of cannabis. Guys, this is, this is amazing and wonderful. All right, so this is like a shameless shout out to myself. I actually um, had the privilege and honor of being part of that 3,500 number. I published three articles during the time of COVID um, during my consultancy with other medical cannabis companies where we ran uh, double blind, randomized, placebo controlled trial, which is not easy, decentralized so the patients didn't have to move. We did an open label trial and I just did a, um, remember I told you about that phase one trial, a little fun, you know, friends and family did one of those and got that published as well as using CBD for pain. Next. But anyway, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in 2017 looked at all of the of that body of articles and took out what they thought were the most robust and strongest um, peer reviewed articles. They, so they looked at 10,000 peer reviewed articles, which to me is amazing undertaking. And in 2017 published the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids. And if you want to, you can actually download this free of charge. You could buy it, but you could download it free of charge. And what they did is they looked at 11 groups of different health topics, everywhere from, from neurologic to mental health, to cancer, to um, perinatal and children. Next. 
and they arrived at a hundred different research conclusions. And then they put them into five different categories from the most conclusive to no evidence or insufficient evidence. Now, remember, this is a retrospective. They look behind. This was published in 2017. Okay, so I just, I need you to reframe this. And it's, it's a rear view look at what they've learned from these peer review articles. This has nothing to do from 2017 on where there's been incredible uptick in new peer um, reviewed publications. So I just wanna sort of give you that, um, that framework to, to think about. But what they found, just as some fun facts here, pain relief, nausea and vomiting and appetite stimulation were, were very conclusive. Now, I didn't see any of that on the Texas list, but if they wanna say, where's the research? Where's the clinical research, right? That's the mantra of today. Where's the clinical research? 2017, here it is. Next. But what about all those patient stories, right? You always hear like, oh, well, my friend had back pain and he tried cannabis and it worked well. I believe that these things are the most important and it's what? It's the reason why in California in 2019, that passed because of this, this lobby and advocacy because of patients, because of their stories, showed these legislators, why are we you know, drinking this ridiculous juice that cannabis is, is a terrible thing and has no medicinal therapeutic properties? We'll get into, into this in a sec, but there is actually a hierarchy of like, of, of, cl of clinical trials. And sadly, patient stories are at the bottom, so much so that they call them anecdotes, right? Did you ever hear that word anecdote? Anecdotally, off this cuff. I hate that word. I really do, because at the end of the day, when you gather up all of those anecdotes, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, it becomes real world evidence that the FDA is now accepting. Next. So the hierarchy, next slide. So the gold standard is this placebo controlled, double blind, randomized trial. So let's talk about what that is. So a double blind means the patient doesn't know whether they're getting a real drug or if they're getting a fake drug or you know a sugar pill. The person giving out that was running the study or the person that's in charge of the study doesn't know whether it's real or if it's, if it's a placebo. Randomized means that there is a computer generated uh, methodology so that somebody comes in and you're, you know, yes or no, and you get, you know, you get from this box, you get from this box. So nobody has any idea. So really no cheating allowed. And placebo controlled means just that it's a sugar pill. All right. Anybody have any questions about what this, what this means? Cause it's really important. This also means that it's an active dosing that people are actually getting something. It's not up to the patient to get it. They don't get to choose. They're actually getting something. So all of these things are controlled. The only thing better than a gold standard, because everybody be like, oh, well, where's the placebo controlled trial, right? You'll hear this all the time. Is platinum controlled, is platinum st standard, which is you take all the golds, you take all of these peer reviews and you run a meta-analysis on them to see if you have reproducibility. Right, because if you can reproduce something, then nobody, it, it's irrefutable. And then you have the observational studies, which means things that people do for themselves. And this is not just in the cannabis world, this is in, in, in all studies, right? Observational studies. And they look at cohort and case controlled studies where you're not actively being given medicine, you're taking things or you have an exposure on your own. So the Schaefer report and the LaGuardia report are basically these observational studies. People are either taking them or they're not. So for a cohort study of a, a bunch of people who are very similar. So let's say, I don't know, blonde haired, blue eyed accountants from Austin. Okay. And they either have an exposure to something or they don't. So maybe they have an exposure to cannabis and then you follow them along and see whether or not they have a problem compared to the control group or they get better compared to the control group. And that's what the Schaefer report did. A case controlled study, another observational study, you have similar groups of people. Again, you're blonde haired, blue eyed, 
accountant from, from Austin, but this group had a medical problem. I don't know, colon cancer, and this group didn't. And now you look retrospectively to see what would cause that problem. And that's actually how they found like high fat diets or barbecuing red meat, sorry guys, um, can lead to colon cancer from this. And then you have the case reports. To me, this is the, the, the most valuable. These were the things that really show legislators what's going on, because I believe a picture speaks volumes. And so I'd like to share with you a couple of case, case studies of my own that I've experienced. I am a physician. I don't practice as a doctor where I have a sign and you come in and I see you and, and, and I write a recommendation, but I do have over 400 people that I consult with when doctors don't know what to do with them and they sort of have a Hail Mary pass. And so I take them on um, and I help guide them. I change their diet. I give, I help guide them with cannabis, depending upon what state they're in, we'll determine what we can utilize. And then I share some of these things with, with um, in conferences with legislators, with other colleagues of mine to help them see, you know, what can happen. So this is a, a patient, she's eight years old and she's in hospice. She was on methadone and morphine for metastatic cancer that infiltrated her brain. And so the white, this is bone, that's her skull. I used to say MRI, white is either bad or bone, but it's also some dense tissue as well. But all of this is metastatic cancer in her brain. And when we were called upon to see her, the goal was to try to improve her quality of life before she died. So she was on methadone and morphine only. We changed her diet to a whole food, all plant, no added oil, no processed food diet. And we gave her uh, a combination of medical cannabis in both the raw form as well, a full spectrum raw form, as well as a um, decarboxylated form. So the acid CBDA, THCA, CBGA, as long with THC, CBD, CBG, along with the terpenes and a tincture, a couple of drops under her tongue. And so she went from morphine and methadone to just methadone to just, to just off just the cannabis oil. Then she started running around. And then she started doing, who here are parents or have kids or know what an eight-year-old is like? So um, she started exhibiting appropriate eight-year-old behavior, like talking back, <laughs> the power eye roll, you know, refusing to take a bath. And the mom's like, this is not the behavior of a child who should be in hospice and got another MRI, even though she was in hospice. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's no more cancer here, just a little bit here in the back. And that was February we began, April. And I don't know when this happened because she wasn't in active treatment by any doctor. So essentially we, trans, we, um, we transferred her from hospice to second grade, to third grade, to fourth grade, to fifth grade. And sadly, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a mom and I know how horrible it is to have a kid with like a strep throat, let alone this. And they were lost to follow up and sadly she passed. But still, can we do, I mean, this is irrefutable and cannabis and diet were the only two things that changed in her. Yes. Okay, so this was 2015. I, I had what I had. I was, I was, so, but no, not because it's closer to the brain. If you would think about closer to the brain, you would think intrathecal, you know, it direct administration, which um, like if she had a port, you know, I would almost even think about that because there are animal models where they do actually drop THC into the, you know, glioblastoma tumor of a, a mouse and it, it sort of goes away. This is what we had. And I wasn't going to have an eight-year-old smoke anything, you know, that, that, you know, which, what's that? So the challenge with suppositories, so the suppositories are really interesting me method of administration, right? But if you take an anus, any anus, and you cut it in half, half of the blood flow goes to what's called the portal circulation, which goes to the liver. 
the other half goes throughout the body. So when it goes to the liver, it gets metabolized. So the things that you think you're getting, you're not getting, you're getting metabolites. Okay. So I don't know with cancer patients, whether or not those metabolites are good or bad or net sum zero. So that's number one. Number two is I don't know if just because you put cannabis in a, in a oil-based suppository and, and administer it, I've never seen the clinical research that shows me that it actually gets into the bloodstream. In fact, I may almost think it might not only because I had a patient go, doc, I used like 20 of these things. I didn't get high and I'm so much better. I'm like, well, if you didn't get high, Houston, we have a problem. Oh my God, I'm in Texas. This actually applies here. Um, so I, I, I don't know that. You know what I mean? And I want to make sure this kid's dying. I want to make sure this gets in. I believe though, if you had like a localized cancer, a suppository could actually work amazingly well as like um, a supposit as a topical, which we do know could work. We do know there are receptors there. I just, again, don't know. I've never seen any PK studies, meaning blood levels once a suppository is used. So as soon as sh somebody shows me that paper, I'll be using suppositories on kids all day long because, you know, cannabis tastes cannabis-y. Some people love it. Some people don't. Good question. Slide. So this is another patient. Um, he is a 70 some odd year old guy who woke up in the emergency room after a seizure with this in his head. Um, somebody knew somebody who knew somebody who knew me said, could you help these people out? Um, I'm like, sure. Changed his diet, whole food, all plant, no added oil, no processed food diet. Gave him some cannabis, sublingual tincture. Somehow, three weeks after this initial MRI, he got this MRI. Nobody even knows why. Like, but somebody's like, oh, it's time for your MRI. And his wife duly took him. And this report said central cystic clearing. Obviously responding well to radiation therapy, keep it up. His appointment for the radiation oncologist was the week after this MRI was taken. Is that, I mean, is that incredible? Sadly, he died, but let me tell you how. He, it, you know, men and women after a certain age have to get up and use the facilities all hours of night and day. He had a rug that was not secured to the ground he slipped, fell down a flight of steps, hit his head. I mean, this is insane, right? On autopsy, they could hardly even find the tumor. There's a law against cannabis, but not uncontrolled rugs. Anyway, there are lots of clinical research studies that talk about cannabis and cancer. Not a lot in, in humans, but a lot in animals and a lot in cell cultures. Next slide. I mean, a lot. I just didn't even have to look hard for it. Next. So this is a really interesting case study. He's a 35-year-old kid who had an endoscopic sinus surgery, and it went awry. It hit a cranial nerve, which is the nerve coming directly from the brain, and was in the most exquisite pain. Doctors tried everything, started him on, sadly on opiates, and you can see an escalating dose. He changed his diet to a whole food oil plant, no added oil, no processed food diet, and started him on cannabis. We did it in a couple of different ways with him, sublingual to get him into a, a steady state, and then using um, vaporized flour for the immediacy when he would get these spasms from this, from this pain. And as you can see in just six weeks, he went from a lot, of, a lot of opiate to less than half of what he was taken to less than half again. And this was in 2016 or 17, I think. And he is off all opiates to this day using cannabis only to treat his medical conditions. And again, there is lots of clinical research that supports this. Real world evidence. So real world evidence means you take real world data and you sort of collate it together. And the FDA is now accepting that. So maybe a single case study 
They won't accept it, next. But an amalgam of case studies, amalgam of these glioblastomas that do well, amalgam of a bunch of pancreatic cancer patients, an amalgam of people who are in chronic opiate use and got often, got off them. And so it actually looks at it. And so real world evidence has now been approved by the FDA as being an opportunity to substantiate why you want to take a drug to market. So they look at electric, uh, electronic health records, they look at medical claims, they look at billing data, insurance data, and doctor records as well. So this should be empowering to all of us who are advocates that wanna bring our group of children who have epilepsy and who've responded not only to CBD, because not every child does, but to THC or THCA. And all of those things should be allowed to be administered, right? It should be done by a doctor-patient relationship. So where's the relief? That was part of the thing that Heather gave me. I had to say research relief. So research relief equals patient relief, meaning giving us the freedom to conduct real live clinical trials in real live people will only substantiate the legitimacy of cannabis as a medicine or not, because nothing's a panacea and nothing is 100%. Anybody who tells you that is selling you snake oil and I'm not doing that. But what it does tell you is that it should be used as a medicinal tool amongst all of the other medicinal tools that are not 100% either. I mean, if everything were 100%, there wouldn't be multiple classes of antibiotics or multiple classes of blood pressure medicines, right? This is not new. And having to try things and change things, that's not new. We do that all the time with patients. So this should not feel uncomfortable in order to do this. So the research relief, we have challenges and then opportunity. So federal status of cannabis, the fact that it is a illegal drug in a, in a schedule one that shows no legitimacy, highly addictive and no medical or therapeutic value makes it very difficult because a place like Texas A&M that is supported by federal monies and grants and if there's a medical school arm to this, is there a medical school as part of Texas A&M? Yep. Yeah. They, get, they get money from Medicare and Medicaid and from the government and NIH grants for studying. All that's in jeopardy unless you have a DEA Schedule One license. And even when you do, you cannot use real world cannabis in this facility. Is that incredible? Is that like unbelievable to you? Meanwhile, fun fact, in 1988, there was an approval of an FDA drug called dronabinol. Does anybody know what that drug is? Synthetic THC. Did you hear what I just said? 1988, so I'm sadly old and I, I was a doctor then, I could write a prescription in every 50 states for anyone here in this room for dronabinol, synthetic THC. Now, if it has no therapeutic value, why are we sitting in a Schedule I drug if I can, since 1988, do this? How about this? No one in the room raised their hand. Does anybody know that the USA has a patent on cannabinoids? A patent since 2006 on cannabinoids as a neuroprotectant. Does any... This is your tax dollar. You know the tax thing that you fill out every April 15th? I think this year it's April 18th. Do you know that you paid for that? And you didn't know the endocannabinoid system. It wasn't, true. It wasn't taught in a biology class. And if you had a stroke, that would be actually the first therapeutic drug you should be taking as a neuroprotectant to reduce the swelling and the injury to the rest of the cells. Yet, anyway, so... Relief for patients will be relief for research. I'm gonna to skip to number three, which is IRB approval. So IRB stands for Investigational Review Board. And what that is, it's an independent board. Many universities have them and they sit on a committee where they look to make sure that people aren't being abused during these, during these experiments. It's a very important ethical board. However, we're people, right? 
and people sit on boards and people have preconceived notions based on emotion, based on marketing, and may not know about the endocannabinoid system and the power of it, and therefore are in charge of it. There are, so that's a problem. And on top of it, you can't do the investigation of real plant material you know, in a university status. In 1968, the DEA approved a single cultivator at a university in Mississippi. I'm sure we've all heard of that, right? And they grow, they poorly grow cannabis for medical use and research. So people are like, okay, then why can't we just use that if I can use it for research? So the FDA says, okay, you wanna have something called an, in, um, an investigational new drug, IND, and you fill out this thing called an NDA, new drug application. And you say, I wanna take ditchweed from University of Mississippi, and I wanna make extract it, concentrate it, make it into a capsule, and I wanna treat it for blonde hair, blue eye accountants in Austin. I don't know, for this particular illness that they may have. And they say, fine. The problem is, is that this DEA licensed grower was only permitted to do research and not permitted to sell. And the FDA will not let you say, they don't do translation. Well, if you got this cannabis from here and a molecule is a molecule, then you can use the cannabis here and you'll still be FDA approved. Does, does, does anybody, do people understand the gravity of this? So if I spent the time, energy and millions of dollars, millions upon millions, tens of millions going to the FDA, because it's highly expensive, just to communicate with them, you have to buy a $30,000 piece of software. So we're not talking cheap here. Just to, just to do that and get it all through the processes and you can't sell it, you can't get to phase four because by definition, the DEA would not allow you to sell the cannabis that was grown from University of Mississippi. How's that? Opportunities. There are four new DEA licenses which is amazing. And they are allowed to grow for medical use, for research and for sale. The challenge with this, ready for this one that I think probably we all could have thought about if we thought about it for a second, pharmaceutical companies are now buying up their entire crops, almost like corn, like they're hedging their bets and taking it away from like small companies that wanna to go to the FDA. State mandated research is an amazing opportunity. So for example, in Pennsylvania, there is a state mandate that allows for businesses who get a special license to grow, cultivate and have dispensaries, but also have to pay X number of dollars to participate in research. So Temple Medical School, my alma mater, also is participating in that as well. I'm actually fortunate enough to be head of their clinical research, which makes me super excited. We're just submitted our first publication. We just found out, at least in Pennsylvania, number one use for cannabis, anxiety, not pain. Interesting, right? But anyway, state mandated research should be everywhere until this is descheduled, right? Everyone's asking, where's the clinical research? Put your money where your mouth is. Let's do it. The challenge of this state uh, mandated research, again, is that because these people are funded by the government, they've got grants, they've got medical students, they've got residents, they've got um, Medicare and Medicaid, they can't use the actual plant. So you have to be a little bit crafty about how you do this. And that's how I make my money, not on the backs of patients, but trying to help come up with interesting ways that are legal to conduct clinical research using real world medicine. Opportunities for research in legal states, every state has this opportunity. It's just super expensive, but the money really needs to go towards this. IRB approval, remember we talked about whether or not these investigational review boards from institutions will, will sort of be cloaked in prejudice uh, based on cannabis. There are independent IRBs that can be used and I use them. And they, as long as the protocol is, is um, ethical and that we're treating patients well and their risk benefit ratios that are in the favor of the patient or the subject that's participating, they're, they're all about substantiating it. And what about the FDA? Where do they stand in all this? Believe it or not, they've actually finally come out with a pathway. 
not saying it's easy, not saying it's cheap, but at least they've acknowledged that there needs to be a pathway, that there's more and more people out there looking to support it, looking at both cannabis derived compounds, meaning that you've extracted it from the plant itself versus cannabis related compounds, meaning that you have a synthetic or biosynthetic mechanism of attaining these molecules. But go figure, where am I? Next. Okay, so I think we've done a lot of talking today. I'm looking at my watch. I think I've done this over an hour for a half hour talk. I tend to do that. Um, so we've examined the role of research, the importance of research, the fact that there's tons and tons of research out there. We need to know that research is important for freeing this plant. Freedom of this plant is freedom of every single person in this room because you may not be sick now, but you may know somebody that you love in the future that may be sick that you wanna help. And you want to make sure that this plant is free to be used as a medical tool, just like any other therapeutic. You wanna make sure this plant is free so that a doctor patient can decide jointly whether or not this is the right tool and not legislated on a list somewhere. Anyway, that's all for today. Next slide. If you wanna contact me, thank you for listening. And if anybody has any questions, I'm open. Yes. Right. In our last legislative session, it would be expanded the capacity program a bit to include PTSD in all cancer patients, which is fabulous. Yes. Um, but it included an element of IRBs here within the state. Okay. Uh, allowing institutions to work with dispensaries with Texas Medicine um, to research designated conditions um, that are designated by our Department of State Health Services Commissioner. Okay. So we can kind of lobby him to add pain, for example, top on my list. Of things that we can research with Texas Medicine, Texas Institution. Amazing. Get the data, take it to the lawmakers. You've been looking for it. We've been bringing it to you, but right. here, here's some right here. Here's some here. Is that generally how it works? What things should we be looking for, for to maximize this opportunity? So, IRBs are when you're talking about doing clinical research regarding patient administration. You can, but you don't necessarily have to get an IRB approval if you were to do an observational study looking at pain as an indication. So you have to narrow your scope of what kind of pain, what kind of patient, whatever. And if people go in, you can give them uh, a survey form. So there are part of the IRB what needs to be done and what are exempt. So observational studies, generally speaking, um, or survey studies are exempt. I tend to get it only be, get an IRB approval. It costs an additional thousands of dollars depending upon the IRB that you're using. But if it's an outside the university, they're generally open to at least looking at it. And if they see that initially it's a survey study, I, I've never had a problem at all. The beauty of an IRB approved study is that when you go to publish, you can then publish in peer reviewed scientific journal articles as opposed to in magazines. Again not to disparage magazines, any way that we can get out of education that's robust and true and real and substantiated by research is important. But to get it and claim this is a peer reviewed journal, that's huge. But in order to do that, you need an IRB approval. Yes, sir. Matt Strawberry, local physician in Texas. So you're saying uh, to get to the gold standard, to go through that IRP, you can't use marijuana from the plant um, because that would have to come from DEA, which would have to come from a farm that's being bought up. So it sounds like isolates. So, so the FDA is, is, is in a, um, is moving in this direct, like they, they, they just are sort of forming this. So this is a nascent thought for them. I don't know why, but yes. So right now there's a botanical way of going to the FDA, but you have to have stabilized genetics. So there is a, if you go onto the FDA site and look up the um, botanical guidelines, so for any botanically derived medicine, not just cannabis, there are, uh, there's a, a, a guideline that you go through 
And when you go and you have a pre-IND meeting with the, with the FDA, you meet with your group, you go through the guideline and you tell them what you have and they say, okay, or not. So you can use plant-derived cannabinoids. Okay. Isolates are easier because then you're sort of uh, avoiding that step, but you can use that step. Is there a pathway? Would you recommend a pathway for investigation of these new drug applications? I'm sorry, say that again? Investigation on the drug to say, hey, well, this, this is a product that's uh, already on the market and already is used. We're going to consider this as an investigation in the drug instead of going through the what you just said with the so no, they won't. That's that's not where they're at right yet. Okay, because when you say on the market, you mean the dispensary or however in Texas is dispense, they don't look at that as legit. This is literally the Wild West. This is the greatest like human experiment outside the purview of, of FDA, you know, since the early 1900s, quite frankly. Um, and I'm shocked that they have not jumped into this and created this. But if you want to look at uh, real world evidence of a botanically derived cannabinoid drug, look at Epidiolex. GW Pharma has a greenhouse cloaked somewhere in London. I tried to get into it and they didn't show it to me, but um, they have stabilized genetics forever and ever, which to me, Texas A&M, the A part of the ag, how beautiful is that? where maybe they can determine and stabilize certain genetics. And then those genetics from Texas A&M can go through the botanical guidelines and then submit an IND through there. What? Excellent. So plant breeding, so, so part of the farm bill demands stabilized genetics, right? Because you've got it, you can't have a hot plant, you know, 0.3% which is fabulous. So you take that knowledge and you translate it to the cannabis plant for reals and, and let, it, let it grow, you know, like figure out how the best to stabilize it and maybe really cool methodologies. Maybe, you know, maybe it is through tissue culture. Maybe there is some other genetic stabilized way. Sir? Here's something I find amazing since you brought up the dialects. It's a CBD, it's an isolate derived and they're using that as a new medication ingredient. Yep. And I've seen a, a research thing on YouTube where uh, since it's being used for a new medication ingredient, you can't simultaneously use it as a food source or food. You can't use it as nutraceutical. You know what the drug is going to do in food. You got it. So all these stores that have CBD plus, you put a target on your back. But when we talk phytocannabinoid rich, we're not talking about just CBD. We're of course. We're talking about whole plant. Yes, exactly. So, I was just going to ask yep. you, what are your thoughts on? I mean, it sucks, is, right? It's terrible. But, hard. but, but this is the thing. This is the FDA. So they say what, what, so what he's saying is if you have a drug that is FDA approved for a specific indication, that's the part you forgot, which I'll get into in a sec. Sorry, no, 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 no. This is an important distinguishing factor that allows for the CBD to be sold in Whole Foods and, you know, HEB or wherever else. Um, it, it will not be allowed to be made into a nutraceutical. So, you, so then you're like, well, how does that work? Because ibuprofen back in the day used to be a prescription only drug, but that was at a 600 and 800 milligram dosage form. If you look on your, on your tablets at home in your, in, in, in your bathroom, it's 200 milligrams. So you have to have distinguishing features from a drug to a nutraceutical but there is a long nutraceutical pathway as well that's FDA approved. So a couple of things. One, CBD for epidiolex as a drug is for two seizure indica epilepsy indications, only Dravet and LGL, right? And that's it. So if you are selling beyond that scope, you're still okay. That's what that new drug application was filed for, period. So that's sort of the saving grace. The other thing is, Unless you went through this IND new drug process, you better not make any claims because they will, they will take you out for that. You know, because so claim is a bad thing and um, stepping into the purview of what Epidiolex is used for. Does that make sense? Any other questions? These are great questions. Nobody's asked me these. No, they're awesome. I love them. All right. I think that's it for now. Thank you so much for spending the time with me.